Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm the host, Sean Boyce. I'd like to welcome my guest to the show today, Evan Linhart from Bernstein Private Wealth Management. Hello, Evan. How are you? And thanks for being on the show. I'm good. Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, I'm excited to get kind of our podcast underway here. Before we do that, if you wouldn't mind, for our listeners, if you could go into a little bit more detail about your background and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Kind of a windy background if you just looked at my resume on paper or online. But I think it really all started, I won't give you the Evan Linhart full biography, but I think it all started. My father's a physician. My mother was a social worker, both in areas where they you know, were helping other people and gained a lot of joy from that. And I think I saw that from an early age and thought, you know, how can I do that? I think I felt that a little bit volunteering when I was younger, but it really came to be when I taught a class in college, I was a TA, and that really spurred me to think about education. I just really gained a lot of joy from that, which set me on a course in that space from Teach for America to government work, and then to a leading nonprofit in Philadelphia called Philadelphia School Partnership, where I led the development work there. And in that space, I saw two huge gaps, one being the donors I was work, I was working with were not aligning their philanthropy with their personal investments. So if you're giving $100,000 to the nonprofit, you better believe that you have a lot of personal assets there too. And why are you not thinking about using those assets to make an impact like you are through your philanthropy. So the most egregious example would be giving to an environmental nonprofit. And in my personal investments, I'm invested in fossil fuels. Totally contradictory to the work you're doing in your philanthropy with your personal assets. So that I thought just a huge miss. The second was when I was at the nonprofit, thinking about the people who were sitting at the other side of the table from us who were you know, trusted advisors of ours. Many of them were not ever sitting on the other side of the table where I was. They were not in a nonprofit. They didn't understand how nonprofits were run, people wearing multiple hats, um, their mission, and how they want to align their work with that. And so, again, I just thought that the advice that those people could give wasn't through the lens of those that they were trying to serve. And so I thought that was another big miss. And so came across Bernstein over those years as fundraising through both those philanthropists that I worked with, but also some of the things that they were doing to help the nonprofit community in the region. And um, over time, really thought, wow, I can make a huge impact on nonprofits, on foundation, on people with charitable inclination, and really helping to guide those people given the lens and career path that I had had. And I think, you know, that's a, an odd transition from being a school educator to working in government to a nonprofit to be in private wealth. But I think my thread was, you know, how am I using my eight, 10 more hours a day to make an impact? And how can I do well doing that also? And so it's the kind of Let's do well and do good at the same time. I don't think those things have to be mutually exclusive. And that's really led me to building out the mid-Atlantic practice for Bernstein in that space, really working with mission-driven organizations and people to align their wealth with their values and make sure that their families are achieving those goals. I think scaling impact is such a great way to describe the work that you're doing. And that's what I was, that was going to be my take. And as you talked about how you've made those career transitions thus far, that's how I would envision it as well, really staying true to the mission, but scaling that to another level of impact in each instance. And I just love this mission so much. We've talked about this at length already, but it's such a creative solution to a unique problem. Um, And there's a lot more that I want to dive into with regard to that topic on our episode here today. So thank you for sharing Uh, Is there any more detail you'd like to share so that folks can get a better understanding and kind of like how it works, some of the details about each of the folks on either side and how they work together and how you make that marriage happen? I think it'd be great to learn a little bit more about that first. Yeah, I think from, you know, our core skill set, which is the research planning and direct investment as an investment firm, you know, we're really engaging with people along a lot of different spectrums. If you're an organization 
good example would be that we would engage with your board and our first discussions, not about your investment portfolio, but about the purpose of the assets that you might have. How are we aligning that purpose and understanding that purpose to be able to then build your investment portfolio? Uh, and that's really where it starts from an individual perspective or from a mission-driven organization. And so the mechanics are, how, are we how have we developed the right exercises to be able to elicit that from the people that we're working with so that we can really engage with them in the appropriate way? One of the ways we do that is we actually have a couple of card exercises that we do where you can prioritize uh, what's most important to you. And we can really dig into that and understand what might be most important, but also how you define different types of priorities. So one of the card has the word risk on it. Well, you might define risk very differently than I do. And if you're a board, there's multiple perspectives coming in. How are you reconciling all that? So that's one way we try to think about that. And we do that with individuals and, and like I said, with, with boards. And there's a number of those that really are helpful. So I think you can get a little bit of a sense that the first thing you're not talking about is stocks and bonds. You're, you're going back to the core. Why are you doing this? If you're an individual, why are you thinking about investment? What are your goals for those investments? And then quite frankly, the investment side, I think, is the, the easiest part. Um, it's really figuring out how to align those two that I think is most important and takes time and, and takes some vulnerability. But in the end of the day, we're, our benchmark is you meeting your goal. It's not necessarily the financial benchmark. It's are you meeting the goal? And obviously the financial piece is tied to that. Um, but if you're meeting your goals, that's what's going to make our clients happy. And that's what we're striving to do. Very well said. And I also have to imagine that this is a, a great opportunity for growth here as well, too as we've seen people make more socially conscious decisions, right? Being real conscious about the decision making that they do, the products that they buy, which obviously might as well extend to everything else and where they put you know, their money, how they grow their wealth, those types of things as well too. To know that these options are out there now is awesome. It's just, it's very cool. And I think it can be a differentiator as well too. So I see that being a key element of what folks are going to just want more of moving forward. So Hopefully, um, you're seeing quite a bit of growth here, and that that pattern will continue. I have to imagine based on trends we're seeing elsewhere as well. So, thank you for sharing uh, more detail about the business and a little bit more about how it works. That's a big part of what we want to focus on. You know, what we do at Next Step, we focus on figuring out how we can really scale impact for nonprofit organizations that want to extend the reach of their programs and help more people because there's so many folks out there doing so much cool stuff. Your uh, background includes a significant amount of that. So among the other things we wanted to talk about on today's show, uh, since you have quite a bit of experience on in this area as well, too, is some of those unique challenges related to kind of growing and scaling the impact for these nonprofit organizations, particularly as it pertains to fundraising, right? Which, since your expertise lies in this area as well, too, who better to ask, right? So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about where you've seen some of those unique challenges, and I can share some thoughts as well too. And I'd love to get into further into, you know, for our listeners, how they go about solving those challenges and uh, ways in which you guys have uh, been able to move the needle there as well. Yeah, certainly always an evergreen challenge fundraising uh, it, with depending on the nonprofit. Uh, there might not be any other revenue, but what you get from your philanthropy and fundraising. And so it's obviously not a unique challenge to nonprofits across the board, those that are heavily endowed all the way to those startup nonprofits. You're always thinking about where that next revenue is coming from so that you can enhance and achieve the mission. So look, one of the things I think we've found particularly lately is the amount of individual fundraising. So when we look across the board, you know, more than 60% of philanthropy is done by the individual. And so, yes, foundations have a huge part, corporate, huge part of philanthropy, but it really comes down to the individual. And it's, so how are you engaging and understanding who's engaging with your nonprofit? And that's a big focus that we've been doing. Obviously, a big reach is social media. And that's been obviously a big push with COVID uh, as people aren't out and about as much. Social media has become a huge part. And so how are we leveraging 
our branding and marketing teams for our clients to help them out. We're a world-class global firm. We have a very sophisticated marketing team. Uh, I'm not a franchise of Bernstein. It's not Evan Linhart's franchise of Bernstein. I work with and for and alongside all the talent that Bernstein has. And so it's really great that we can then access our marketing team to bring to the table for nonprofit clients. And I think telling your story, not just in the impact that you have, but also on the financial side, I think your 990 that your nonprofit is publishing. How are you showing donors and stakeholders how you're making an impact through your financials? I think it's a, it's a missed piece there. But from a fundraising perspective, I think it's uh, really important that you're stewarding those donors over time and really engaging with them in different mediums. And millennials plus are those that are going to take that helm and they're individuals who are thinking even at an earlier age than their parents about philanthropy and how to make impact. And so I think if you're not engaging with that group and starting to bring them along, I think you're having a, a big miss in philanthropy. Um, but that's hard because there's a, there's a runway. So it's, it, it is a balance for sure. Well said. Another element of this, and this is something that I know you and I have talked about before, is some of those unique challenges related to fundraising and the kind of the disconnect between some of the funding sources and ultimately where those organizations can make or drive the biggest impact. We talked about it from the perspective of where a number of the different sources where the funding comes from, uh, grants and donor money, oftentimes come with some arbitrary uh, strings attached that may be like predetermined before projects even get started. We see that quite a bit in what we do from a product strategy perspective for our nonprofits trying to scale impact. The unfortunate challenge there is, you know, I basically like chicken and egg problem, right? Like I need the funding to do what we need to do. But at the same time, they've given me a list of homework that I absolutely have to achieve in order for me to get the money. Uh, but then once I get the funding, if I find a better opportunity, I might be handcuffed in my ability to be able to explore that and do more and like move towards that area where I can make a more dramatic impact um, because of those limitations and that, that funding and where the strings attached come from. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this challenge as well, too, if you've seen this uh, in your area of expertise and how organizations can kind of think about combating that in different creative or unique ways. Yeah, so there's certainly an imbalance with the power in that sense, especially those that are really reliant on philanthropy, whether it's from individual foundation or corporate donors. Um, and it presents a, a large challenge for nonprofits. But I think nonprofits have to realize, and, and this is where I've seen success, that they're a key piece of that donor or foundation's mission for impact. They are on the ground. They are the experts in the field. They are doing the work. They have the data. They have the relationships. And so they hold a huge amount of power. It can be really helpful for donors achieving what they want to achieve. I think the donors also have to take a step back and reflect on their end. How can they most get to whatever goal they're trying to get to, which is impact in, let's say, a certain sector? Um, do they, are they the expert? Do they know the most about it? And if the answer is no, how are they then relying on the expertise of the nonprofit, the leadership at the nonprofit to steward their funds to make the impact they have? I mean, look, the greatest example of this is what Mackenzie Scott has recently done. She's given away billions, but she's given it away without strings attached. She's given it to organizations that she's believed in and her team believes in. And those organizations are to do with it what they want. I think the pendulum has swung over past, let's say, decade plus to this restrictive, you're going to do this work in this area. And a lot of nonprofits have taken that money because they want to achieve their mission, but have then unfortunately had too much mission creep and have moved away maybe from their core mission, almost chasing that money. And I think that's obviously created friction there. And to your earliest point, there is that tension of, do I as a nonprofit leader speak up to my donors 
and say, you know what, I actually don't think that's the right place to be spending the money. I think it's over here because this is what we know and we see. And if they say that, do they risk losing the money? And is that okay, maybe, because you're educating on the other side? So I think there has to be that trust back and forth. There has to be that um, that that dialogue or both sides aren't achieving their mission. Easier said than done uh, because there is that power imbalance. But I think as donors and as nonprofit leaders, if you're both taking a step back and reflecting on that, I've seen that be the best side. And I think those executive directors and nonprofit leaders who do that work gain a lot of credibility and trust. And I can just see that from my experience previously and from my clients who um, have that relationship with the, with their donors. Such a great point. And that example you gave is a great, uh, great instance of the type of results that are capable when the funding doesn't come with strings attached, right? And Kenzie Scott example that you provided, where they've been able to make a tremendous amount of impact, letting the organization's leaders do what they do best, right? They're in that position for a reason. And it's such an interesting dynamic to me because you often don't see the same type of expectations applied to the private or for-profit industries. They're, you know, the VC world or where institutional dollars often come from. They there is a level of trust there to the executives that run those organizations where it's, if you've got a demonstrated track record of success to a certain extent, or you've started a small fire, I'm going to give you enough fuel to make that into you know a significant heating source for everyone else. Um, I don't precisely know exactly why these unique challenges face the nonprofit organizations, because many of them have such phenomenal leaders and they're just excellent at what they do, yet they are having to jump through these kind of extra hoops in order to see what they can do to really make and scale impact because so many of them that I've talked to have such in, such incredible visions for where they can take their organization and how just how many more people they can help. And they need the resources in order to be able to get there. So examples like that are huge. Uh, I think you've done also an excellent job of summarizing this into something that's relatively succinct and probably easier for folks to understand, right? If we're speaking specifically to those donor audiences, if, uh, as you know, to use your words, essentially, if they are not the expert in what it is we need to do, why would they necessarily feel compelled to have to create like a punch list for the folks that are going to have access to that funding to follow, you know, their mission, so to speak, and instead kind of let them do what they do best and bring those results back. So I, you know, I'm curious to, if, you know, for the funders or uh, folks that may be listening or those nonprofit leaders as well, also who want to figure out the right way to kind of establish these relationships based on trust, as you said, uh, to be able to have an open line of communication and figure out together where the area is for us to make the biggest impact. And then for those you know, funding sources as well, too, for them to understand what they need to understand about the process in order to know that, you know, um, to allow the process to kind of play out the way that it should best because that's going to make its best impact. I'd love to hear what advice you have for the folks in this industry in order to navigate this as effectively as they can from where they, wherever they are today to really where they want to get to so they can better scale impact. Yeah, I think it would both, on both ends, it's, it's just being really clear on what impact you're trying to make. And then I think from there, as long as neither side comes into that conversation with a hierarchy, I think that's where you can get a really good conversation. So if I'm a donor asking the question of where do you think we can make the most impact and letting the nonprofit leader express their experience, I think is an easy way. Then from the donor perspective, they have a really good sense of, okay, if I'm going to fund this organization, this is how they're going to use my money. Here's the outcomes that they're hoping to have. And you can decide whether that's the right fit for you. I think from a nonprofit perspective, you know, they have so much to share. Um, and I would encourage them to share that with the community, not only the stories of impact, but how they are looking at and using their own information from being on the ground to solve those problems, which I know a lot 
try to do in the most succinct way as possible, especially when they're on social media and trying to do it in 140 or 60 characters. Um, it's a difficult, it's a difficult process for them, but they certainly, I believe, actually hold the most power and are solving the toughest problems that our world is facing. And to your point about why is it different in business than it is in nonprofit, I wish I knew the answer. Uh, and, you know, I just thank all the nonprofit leaders for the work that they do because uh, it takes a certain person, but they're just as obviously entrepreneurial and sophisticated as anyone in, in any other sector. And, and quite frankly, taking on the responsibility um, in, a, in a more direct way. Hopefully we're in a period kind of a transition now where, you know, we're starting to see unique products and services being brought to market like what you do, where folks can have a more socially conscious, right, mission-driven kind of purpose behind where they're looking to invest their capital, uh, regardless of whether or not it is, if it's for a specific mission, uh, like in terms of how funding has been provided to these organizations before. Hopefully, we're starting to see the same uh, propagate throughout nonprofit organizations as well, too, and where the sources of their funding comes from. So I'd love to see a transition there for sure from less, you know, donor money, obviously, that comes with strings attached to more freedom and flexibility to complete a more, you know, appropriate discovery related process where if we're identifying new opportunities to make major impact and scale up efforts by a multiple, why wouldn't we want to pivot into that, right? Um, think of it more along the lines of how it operates in, you know, the private industry. So I think we've seen some of those concepts be applied, but the industry is trailing behind it a little bit. Hopefully, we're catching up with things like being able to pull these funding sources from uh, areas that don't come with these strings attached. And we've seen things like, you know, uh, lean startup methodologies make their way to nonprofits as well, too, with great books from like Ann Mae Chang about lean impact and things like that. So I think the message is starting to be received. And, you know, with like McKenzie and other great examples of where folks that have made significant contributions, which has led to like unbelievable levels of scaling impact, that can be more of those examples, essentially. Um, the more of those, the better, because then that helps spread the message kind of far and wide. So couldn't agree more with all of that. Um, question I have for you as well, too, is for those that are listening that want to get more involved and be able to kind of help pursue this mission, so to speak, how can someone start thinking about, you know, investing for impact, so to speak, you know, being part of this, uh, being part of this mission to help these organizations kind of grow and scale in the areas where they're able to reach better scale. Uh, since you, this is a great area of your expertise, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are here for anybody who wants to get more involved. Yeah, I, look, there's a lot of education out there around what ESG environment social governance factors are when it comes to how you plug those into traditional financial metrics. Taking a step back, I actually think that this isn't anything new. I think it's just now being understood and categorized a little bit differently. So think about the environment. You can become a much more efficient company, not have as much waste, not have as much implication on the environment. That's actually probably better for your bottom line. Maybe it's an investment up front here, but thinking about things long term, thinking about the social or governance side, thinking about having more diverse perspectives on your board or on your leadership team. We know those companies perform better in crisis or at or in setting a longer term vision. Why? Because there's more perspective in the room to bring more ideas there. And so I don't think this is actually that much different than evaluating a good company. It's just now kind of named and, and put a little bit different emphasis on. And so I think where this can be really important is just understanding what are the things that are important to you and looking for companies that are pushing those ideals. I think there's a really powerful way as a shareholder of a public company, you can be influential. Obviously, we have a large scale. And so as we are proxy voting on certain policies that um, companies are putting up, we can have a big influence on that, you know, while aggregating our shareholder, our value. Um, but I think as an individual, divesting or investing is a really important way to show 
um, where you're going. And I think there's a lot of, obviously for public companies, a lot of public information out there. I mean, you can certainly go to our website, Bernstein.com. We have a whole section about not only our own co corporate responsibility and what we're doing as a firm inside to show the same ideals as those companies we're investing in outside on behalf of our clients. So you can go to Bernstein.com, Purpose Driven. And if you're a nonprofit, certainly same thing, looking at um, our foundation and institution page where we have a lot of research and thought leadership on topics just like this. Thank you for sharing those, Evan, and thank you for being here. Um, you've already shared a few. If there's any others you would like to uh, for the series of a couple of questions I have for you before we let you go, please feel free to do so. But are there any resources um, in addition to the ones that you mentioned? We'll link to those as well also where you'd recommend folks go to learn more about anything we talked about here today or anything else that you'd like them to know about? No, I think that's a that's a good start. There's a lot of information out there. Um, obviously, always can reach out to me. I'm happy to send you some links and articles and things like that. One of the best things I did when I was starting out is just set up your, well, they don't do RSS feeds anymore, uh, really, but to set up those and, and just be a, a consumer of what's going on in that space. It's one of the largest growing investment spaces, the ESG world, and um, a lot is coming out. Some things, as we call it, are purpose light, which are just renamed, but not actually doing that work. And some are actually purposeful, as we like to call it, where it's really doing the research, really holding accountable these companies to do the work and to solve the crises that are happening across the across the world. That's excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and last question I have for you is who should reach out to you and how can they get in touch? Yeah. Nonprofit leaders, donors, um, individuals who are looking to make impact and think about not only their philanthropy, but their personal assets as a way to do that. I think are all great people who are curious about how to do that. And hopefully I can be helpful and add value in that discussion and bring them along that journey wherever they are, if they're farther along or just starting out. You can reach me uh, at by email probably is best, Evan period Linhart at Bernstein.com. And happy to engage in any conversation around this work. I love it. I'm gonna be doing it for the rest of my life. Uh, and so, you know, always happy to engage just to have a other thought partner on the other end, hopefully be helpful. Thank you very much, Evan. I appreciate that. I will, uh, we'll link to that in the show notes as well, too. So if folks uh, want to go more, uh, go, go to any of these locations to learn more, you can find that uh, in the show notes that we produced for this episode. Thank you for pursuing this mission. Obviously it's, it's critically important and I'm excited uh, to continue to get involved in any way that I can help as well. Also, including spreading the message. And thanks for being uh, here to share your experience with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Product Launch. I hope you got value out of it. I like to feature product people on my podcast because that's who I love to help. I'm a product strategist, and I can help you scale your business and grow your profit through a product. If you'd like to learn more about how I can help you, email me at sean at nextstep.io. That's sean, S-E-A-N, at nextstep nxtstep.io or visit my website at nextstep.io. That's nxtstep.io.